Okay, everybody, uh, good morning. It's five after the hour. We'll uh, go ahead and get started. <clears throat> uh, my name is Steve Little. It's an absolute pleasure to have you all here today. Um, this morning, we're going to have the inaugural uh, Fellows Grand Rounds. Uh, we hope this is a, a new event that we're going to repeat every year. Uh, it'll depend on these two. Um, so the, um, let me give them a couple of bios here. So the setup is we have two speakers. Each will go 20, 25 minutes, uh, a little window for some questions. Uh, we end to still uh, end up on time at around 9 o'clock. A um, couple of housekeeping things that I'll announce quickly, and then we'll introduce the speakers. Uh, housekeeping things, there's surveys, of course, as usual. Um, they're at the back. It's very important for the CME accreditation to uh, continue to fill those in. Uh, this is video conferenced and videotaped. Uh, live streaming on Facebook, um, as is everything. So if you miss anything, you want more details, you want to tell your friends and neighbors, uh, YouTube channel uh, will have all of this, as it always does. Uh, last but not least, an important announcement, the Cardiology for the Non-Cardiologist uh, Conference it will be held at uh, Mighty on June 9th, and you're all welcome to that as well. Okay, without further ado, uh, it's my pleasure. I think I'll introduce you both now, and that way we can keep it rolling afterwards. Uh, our first speaker is Alpana uh, Sanapati. Uh, Alpana is third-year cardiology fellow here, of course. Uh, she graduated from Cleveland Clinic in Internal Medicine um, in 2015. She's got clinical and research interests in cardiac imaging. Um, she's published in ECHO, um, in strain imaging, cardiac amyloidosis, uh, and also interests in valvular disease and uh, oncology imaging. Uh, she's going to begin a two-year advanced imaging fellowship here uh, in July. Uh, and then quickly to follow Alpana's discussion will be uh, Ahmed Solomon, also third year fellow. Um, Ahmed did his uh, internal medicine in UT uh, Houston. He worked here as a CCU staff position for four years uh, before joining uh, us for his fellowship. And he'll be joining us on faculty at MBCA uh, in just a couple of months in July. So I think to keep us on track, we'll ask Alpana to just come on up here and enlighten us. All right, thank you. All right, so today I'm going to talk about um, cardiovascular disease in breast cancer patients and specifically the role of multimodality imaging in this population. I have no financial disclosures. Um, the objective today is to highlight the prevalence of cardiovascular disease in the breast cancer population and discuss the role of multimodality imaging, um, specifically echo, um, uh, cardiac calcium score, as well as coronary CT and cardiac MRI in assessing the risk diagnosis and follow-up of uh, cardiovascular disease in this population, and really looking at the future directions as, uh, as uh, we know a little bit more about the role of imaging in this population. <clears throat> so over the last year, there's been a multitude of new data and articles published in really high-impact um, journals, including um, JAK, um, um, JAMA, Clinical um, Journal of Clinical Oncology, um, radiotherapy and oncology, um, and really um, AHA just recently came out with a statement on the cardiovascular disease and breast cancer patients um, three months ago. So I think this, this um, cardio-oncology group is receiving a lot of um, uh, media and as well as a lot of attention, um, and so it's uh, kind of important to kind of talk about this topic right now. Um, so I'm going to talk about two cases. Case one is a 75-year-old female. Um, she has a history of metastatic breast cancer, uh, as well as hypertension, diabetes, um, has a prior diagnosis of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, EF down to 35%. In 1991, she underwent chemo and radiation therapy, and in 2000, underwent bilateral mastectomy um, for breast cancer. Um, at the time of our evaluation, she already presented with a depressed LV function. Um, it was notable that in 2007, she had a normal LV function. Um, we did a coronary angiogram on her, she had minimal CAD, and really, uh, this, is, this is one of the instances where these patients present to us already being treated with chemo and radiation therapy m many, many decades ago when they're presenting with heart failure. And so really for her, the mainstay of therapy is to kind of monitor her closely and treat her with heart failure medical therapy. Um, case two is a 59-year-old uh, female with sarcoidosis. Um, she has a history of mitral valve repair. Um, complicated by infective endocarditis, um, resulting in mitral stenosis, as well as requiring a pacemaker for, for a complete heart block. She was just recently diagnosed with stage two left-sided breast cancer, underwent left mastectomy, as well as radiation 
um, therapy and is currently undergoing um, uh, four cycles of taxin and cyclophosphamide. Um, so really pre-chemotherapy here, EF is well-preserved, um, hyperdynamic. Um, so really, as you can see, breast cancer patients present to the cardiology team as um, in, uh, very variable presentations. And so it's really kind of important for us to kind of keep an open eye about things and how, um, and some of the questions that come up is how do we, how do we better risk stratify these patients and how do we follow up these patients and, and what's the role of imaging in these patients looking long term. Um, so cardiovascular disease and cancer statistics, as you can see over the last four decades, heart disease and cancer has been um, uh, really the two main uh, leading causes of mortality in the United States. Um, cardiovascular disease specifically affects about 48 million women and breast cancer affects about 3.3 million women in the United States. And one in four female deaths are attributed to cardiovascular disease. Um, heart disease has taken the lives of over 600,000 people, a woman um, approaching almost half of that. And breast cancer um, has claimed the lives of about 41,000 people as of 2018. Um, so this is, this is a, these are some staggering numbers and this is just something that we have to keep in mind. So cardiovascular disease remains the leading cause of long-term mortality in breast cancer survivors. Um, as you can see in this graph here, um, for women that are over the age of 66, really at the 10-year mark, um, you know, early on breast cancer-related mortality is probably higher um, in the first, you know, uh, one to five years. Um, but looking at the long-term data, these patients, uh, 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 cardiovascular disease remains the uh, number one killer in these patients. And specifically looking at um, patients with a prior known cardiovascular disease, um, in this large registry that was done with close to 100,000 women, uh, the mean age was 60 across the span of um, uh, a decade or so. It's notable that uh, uh, breast cancer really, uh, uh, the incidence of cardiovascular disease in this population is, uh, is apparent at least within the first five years, and cardiovascular disease remain, remains the long, uh, number one mortality in this patients um, five years onwards. So cardiovascular disease, um, as we know, um, is high among breast cancer survivors. Compared to patients without a history of breast cancer, um, as you can see on this graph here, um, women with breast cancer have a higher rates of cardiovascular mortality. And this is really apparent um, um, after um, seven years after diagnosis. And so there's really something related to cancer itself, and there's really something related to the chemo and radiation therapy that we um, treat breast cancer patients with that is uh, you know, leading to the long-term effects of cardiovascular disease in this population. So, what are the, so you know, breast cancer um, has a lot of overlap with cardiovascular disease. To name, name a few, it's age, family history, obesity, overweight, um, physical activity, and tobacco use. And as we know, there are a multitude of cardiotoxicities that are related to the breast cancer therapies that we use, um, specifically anthracyclines, um, radiation therapy, um, HER2 receptor antagonist, or trastuzumab. Um, and, so, and so we have to be wary of the risk of developing cardiac dysfunction in these populations, especially the higher risk populations that receive high dose anthracycline therapy and or high dose radiation therapy and really sequential treatment for those that receive anthracycline therapy and then receive um, treatment with trastuzumab and or combination therapy even at lower anthracycline doses. And so, and so these are the at risk populations and so, and so many of these breast cancer patients as, as shown in the earlier slides have, um, uh, have a mixed cardiovascular disease or older age at time of diagnosis have multitude of cardiovascular risk factors um, or have had uh, a prior history of cardiac event, myocardial infarction, valve disease, or heart failure. So these are at-risk populations. So I don't think just being young, being treated with the low-dose anthracycline therapy doesn't really put you at low risk. I think everybody really is automatically kind of at moderate to high risk um, for cardiovascular disease. <clears throat> so um, female breast cancer treatment. Um, so as you know, so early-stage breast cancer, at least about 50% of the patients um, receive uh, breast conserving surgery uh, with radiation therapy plus or minus chemotherapy and that varies and then later stages of breast cancer therapy um, tend to include more radiation and chemotherapy so as you can see radiation and chemotherapy it's not something that they use minimally um, this is really kind of one of the mainstays of therapy so we 
will uh, we'll probably be seeing a lot more cardiovascular effects in this population looking at long-term. So anthracycline use. So cardiotoxicity was defined as a drop in the EF more than 10% or, or from the baseline or the drop to less than 50% of the baseline uh, of the LV function. And the risk of heart failure really varies with cumulative doses of anthracycline therapy. So as you can see in this graph here, with higher doses of anthracycline therapy, your cumulative incidence of having a cardiovascular event is much higher for heart failure. So really, there's no safe dose threshold in these patients. So any, any dose of anthracycline therapy, I think it puts these patients at risk for having a, a cardiovascular event. <clears throat> And uh, specifically looking at the incidence of heart failure or cardiomyopathy in these patients, um, those treated with um, um, anthracycline, anthracycline therapy and trastuzumab, which is a HER2 receptor antagonist, um, this, this data over 12,000 patients um, spanning a decade with a mean age of 60, which is a pretty young population, showed that the cumulative incidence of heart failure and cardiomyopathy among those receiving a combination therapy was about 6% at one year and continued to increase up to 20% by five years of follow-up. So the 20% is pretty high, um, and this is a pretty young population. And so specifically looking at an older population, this is a Medicare registry that was, uh, that was performed um, with, uh, uh, with over 40, 45,000 patients or so. And so they looked at the heart failure um, and cardiomyopathy incidence in older aged women, and uh, specifically women over the age of 65, this is the Medicare registry. And what they found was the, the rates of heart failure cardiomyopathy was much higher in the older women. So as we can see in the prior slide, it was about 20% with the combination therapy. In older women with the, you know, um, uh, tend to have more cardiovascular risk factors, the incidence of having cardiovascular related events was much higher, even up to 40% at three years. So this is, this is a problem, and this is, you know, this is, continues to be a problem that you have to be wary about. So how can we use imaging for, um, for assessment of these patients to try to detect some of the subclinical um, cardiotoxicities? Um, so echo strain imaging has really been the mainstay of imaging in these patients. And as we know, strain is, the, you know, uh, is a measure of LV myocardial deformation during a cardiac cycle as a percent of its initial length. So um, one study looked is a meta-analysis looking at the role of strain imaging in these patients. And what they found was um, typically abnormal um, global longitudinal strain is defined as greater than negative 18. So more negative numbers are typically better. And so a reduction of the global longitudinal strain by at least 10 to 15 percent from the baseline predicts cardiotoxicity in these patients. So it has a pretty good ne negative predictive value. So, um, so, and we know from data that um, global longitudinal strain is a strong predicted, uh, predictor of LV function reduction at 12 months. Um, so this data looks at um, basically the, the cardiotoxicity toxicity effects in this population receiving um, combination therapy with the anthracycline trastuzumab in 81 patients. And as you can see here, the um, global longitudinal strain had a pretty good predictive value of, of uh, having cardiotoxicity even up to 12 months um, <clears throat> of therapy. And so, um, and similarly, this graph um, shows the same thing, um, a reduction um, of uh, at least 11% reduction in uh, your LV systolic function has a sensitivity and specificity of about 94%. So we know that strain is a good predictor of of uh, cardiotoxicity and this persists even after 12 months. So echo surveillance. Um, so uh, the AHA um, just recently published this about three months ago, and on a kind of a consensus document about how do we how do we monitor using uh, imaging in this population. So echo surveillance was really recommended. Uh, at baseline, and this can be combined with cardio bi cardiac biomarkers, with troponin, BNP, um, and uh, so at baseline, echo is a, is a, it's you know recommended in this population, and during cu uh, cumulative doses of therapy, typically every three months or so, and at the completion of therapy at six months, and I think it depends center to center, but I think um, it's even reasonable to follow up these patients longer term, especially if you think they're at risk and have additional cardiovascular risk factors. So what's the role of nuclear imaging? So nuclear imaging um, really, I think, uh, has, uh, has kind of fallen out of favor, at least in this, um, in this population, since we have echo and strain imaging. 
Um, so if you're not able to get good echo windows or if you're not able to do strain analysis in these patients and you don't have CMR capabilities, um, nuclear imaging uh, with the MUGA scan has been shown to be a, a good predictor of um, cardiotoxicity in these patients. And this was even uh, noted in the late 1980s when the first uh, landmark paper by Dr. Schwartz et al. Um, came out with this data. And so looking forward, um, there are other things that are being looked at right now um, with MIBG, PET, PET-CT, um, but we don't really have much data on this, specifically looking at cardiotoxicity in this population. So I think there's ongoing research in this, and we may be hearing more about this data later on. So radiation toxicity. So we know anthracyclines cause car cardiotoxicity. So what about radiation toxicity? So this landmark paper published in um, New England Journal of Medicine in 2013, I think really scared the cardio-oncologists and the oncologist um, uh, uh, departments. Um, this is a large um, uh, uh, retrospective review of patients at Sweden Denmark registries. Over 2,000 patients with women undergoing a radiation therapy were looked at. And as you can see here, radiation uh, doses um, on average were about five grays. And the outcomes they measured were death, myocardial infarction, and coronary revascularization. And as you can see here in this graph, those that had um, um, cardi higher incidence of cardiovascular events um, had higher doses of radiation therapy uh, and also had at least one cardiovascular risk factor. So a lot of our patients have hypertension, have coronary disease, or have heart failure, have some sort of at least one cardiovascular risk factor, age. Um, and so with increasing doses of radiation therapy, these it puts these patients at increasing um, risk of cardiovascular events. So um, specifically in the study, what they looked at was uh, what's the, what's the dose, radiation dose uh, threshold um, that's important. And from the study, we know that the exposure to any radiation increases your rate of major cardiovascular events by 7% per gray um, of radiation therapy. And this, was, this risk was similar regardless of whether you had pre-existing cardiovascular risk factors or not. So um, this was important. So this, this uh, noted increase in cardiovascular events was notable even within the first five years, uh, up to 16% events. And this was even noted up to 20 years of follow-up on these patients with the incidence rate of about 8%. So not only do these, are, are these patients at risk for having cardiac events early on, um, you know, in the first five, 10 years of therapy, but even up to 20 years after therapy, um, these patients are at increased risk of having cardiovascular events. So that's important to note. So radiation therapy, we also know that increases the risk of heart failure with preserved LV function, uh, preserved uh, ejection fraction. This is a study looking at 170 patients undergoing radiation therapy, and what they found was even adjusted for age, prior history of ischemic heart disease, atrial fibrillation, cancer, um, staging. Um, uh, uh, having radiation therapy increases your risk of having uh, uh, heart failure with preserved LV function. And so what, what, what are the additional roles of cardiovascular imaging that we can use in this population? As you know, echo, echo strain has been kind of the mainstay of therapy. Um, but there's also, I think, an emerging role for cardiac CT and also cardiac MRI um, in this population. And I'll show you a little bit about some of the data that's out there on this. And so as you know, cardiac CT, cardiac MRI has great um, spatial and temporal resolution. And we can look at the, not just the cardiac anatomy, but also pericardial diseases. As you can see on the left-hand side, um, on the CT, you can detect pericardial thickening, pericardial inflammation, pericardial calcification. Some of the long-term effects of radiation therapy in these patients are pericarditis and constricted pericarditis, leading to a calcification of pericardium. And likewise, on CMR, um, a cardiac MRI, you can detect inflammation of the pericardium, which can help you um, determine um, and kind of guide your therapy with use of anti-inflammatory therapies and, and, and such. And so we know the coronary calcium score predicts car cardiovascular outcomes um, as, uh, as looked at at the large um, MESA study. And we know that calcium score is a strong predictor of cardiac events and adds predictive information beyond the standard cardiovascular risk factors across all major racial and ethnic groups. So if you have a calcium score of zero, that's great. Your event rate is very low, um, less than 1%. But as you increase your calcium score, your event rates increase as suspected. And interesting, um, just carrying a diagnosis of cancer um, just 
just having a diagnosis of cancer increases your progression of calcium score. Um, and this has been looked at in uh, about uh, 50 patients with uh, 50, uh, 50 women and 80 men with cancer from the MESA population. And out of those, 26% have breast cancer. And what's interesting is even adjusting for risk factors, adjusting for race, adjusting for ethnicity, um, patients that had baseline zero calcium score progressed to have uh, increased risk over 10 years. And so this is just an example of a calcium progression in this patient that was treated uh, for breast cancer. And so we know that calcium is, uh, calcium score is associated with cardiovascular events and treated with radiation therapy. Um, and so in this study, looking at about 900 patients, we know that those that had a higher calcium score did uh, poorly hand coronary events at an eight-year follow-up. And so, so how does this help us? So we know the higher pretreatment calcium score is associated with the higher risk of adverse cardiovascular events. And then just, and this can have um, potential meaningful therapeutic interventions in this population that get, you routinely get CT for radiation guided therapy. And this can help identify patients at risk so that we can maybe initiate primary prevention measures, um, aspirin th statins in, this, uh, in these patients earlier on. There's good correlation. Uh, most of these CTs that are, um, that are done for uh, radiation planning are non-gated, but there's studies to show that there's good correlation with calcium score between um, non-gated and ECG-gated um, 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 studies. So calcium score is, a, you're able to do it on non-gated scans as well. And it's actually, this is recommended by the, the Society of Cardiovascular CT and Society of Thoracic Radiology that calcium score should be evaluated and reported in all non-contrast chest CT scans. And so we know that radiation has a direct cardiotoxic effect on, um, on, on a coronary um, uh, artery stenosis and specific anatomic distributions. So higher risk areas are really the proximal RCA, this mid to distal LED and distal diagonal. And looking at this uh, specific study, looking at the distribution of coronary artery stenosis aberration, breast cancer therapy, the, the ones at risk were really the mid to distal LED and um, so these, uh, these patients that had a four to seven fold increase in high grade coronary stenosis in the mid to distal LAD after left sided radiation therapy compared to right sided. And so, no, so this basically proves the point that there is direct toxic effects of radiation therapy and vasculature. So cardiac CTA um, is helpful. You can look at not just the um, luminal stenosis, but you can look at plaque imaging and it's very low radiation risk in the, uh, in, um, in the ideal patient and has a fairly good ne negative predictive value, about 100%. And so modern techniques that, cardio uh, that onc uh, radiation oncologists are using are deep inspiration breath hold to try to get the heart out of the way when they're um, doing radiation therapy, prone uh, imaging to try to get the breast tissue out of the way so you have less direct toxic effects to the coronary vessels, 3D planning and proton radiotherapy. So they are implementing um, different measures to try to minimize the risk of uh, cardiotoxic risk of radiation therapy. So radiation um, heart disease surveillance. Um, so for the patients at risk, uh, you know, anterior or left-sided chest uh, radiation, high doses of radiation therapy, it's recommended to get a screening echocardiogram and at five years after exposure in high-risk patients and 10 years after exposure in low-risk patients. And it's reasonable to get a functional non-invasive stress test for these patients five to 10 years down the road and reassessment of these patients every five years. So what's the utility of cardiac MRI in this patient? Um, so this one study looking at 48 patients um, that received adjuvant trastuzumab therapy in addition to anthracycline, what they showed that, um, that at six months all had mid-myocardial uh, delayed gadolinium enhancement pattern. And, uh, and so what's important is that cardiac MRI is able to give us just the inflammation edema and give us information about interstitial fibrosis, replacement fibrosis and cardiac structures and function. And there's ongoing clinical trials right now that are looking at what are some of the subclinical um, factors that cardiac MRI can contribute to help determine the, the risk of developing uh, heart failure and cardiotoxic effects from these medications. So LV mass index has been uh, demonstrated uh, in this population of um, patients, 90 patients undergoing anthracycline and um, therapy with cardiac MRI. Um, showed that index LV mass had the strongest association with uh, major adverse cardiovascular events. So I think, you know, cardiac MRI can certainly be useful in this population to help predict um, outcomes. And we know that ECV um, 
ECV um, is uh, higher in those treated with anthracycline and even higher in those with uh, depressed LV function. And so we know that elevated ECV suggests expansion of the extracellular matrix and is a marker for diffuse interstitial fibrosis. And so these are all markers that are, these are all things that um, MRI can help um, detect early on this patient populations before the LV, LV uh, function starts to, uh, starts to um, decline. And so these are some ongoing clinical trials right now. Um, some of them are estimated to be completed um, in the 2020s. Um, and two of the studies are incorporating cardiac MRI and the MUGA scans in breast cancer population, receiving um, anthracyclines and trituzumab. And also there's ongoing trials try to look at the imaging markers for subclinical cardiac toxicity in these patients using cardiac MRI and echo. So there's a lot that we don't know, um, but I think uh, uh, people know that this is an important topic and there's a, certainly an increased awareness of the risk of these um, cardiotoxic uh, medications for this population. <coughs> and so really what's uh, in conclusion, I think, uh, I hope I proved to you that there's a really high incidence of cardiovascular risk in breast cancer patients. Um, and so really the best, best approach for use of multimodality imaging in this population re remains to be determined. Um, the opt optimal cost-efficient use of serial imaging for risk stratification um, is, uh, is needed, and so there's ongoing clinical trials to look at this. And so really, I think each patient is different, as I showed you in the first two cases, and so the follow-up for these patients are going to be much, much different. And so what's the role of coronary calcium score pre-treatment and, uh, um, and CT-guided um, uh, radiation therapy planning? And is there a role for CMR for detecting subclinical card cardiotoxicity, so there, we don't have a lot of information on that yet, but there's some ongoing clinical trials to hopefully help answer some of these questions. And obviously, uh, multiple disability care with cardiologists, cardio-oncologists, radiation oncologists is critical to help managing this patient population. So with that, I'll end. Thank you. Trachtenberg gets uh, the first question. Stay up here. Alpen, a great job in summarizing a very uh, important topic, and I think you did a beautiful job of summarizing a lot of the literature. One, one comment and one question. The comment is I'd be a little cautious in saying that strain is the mainstay uh, imaging for, for these patients because, one, it's only done in you know, really highly academic programs. The evidence is good, but it's not perfect. There are some limitations, in, including patients that are volume depleted or hypertensive, that it may not be as accurate. And so there, there's a concern about overreacting to strain. But certainly, it can be a signal that it, that it can lead to cardiotoxicity. So and my question for you is, so, so if you have a, a patient that ha, that's you know, given 20 grays of radiation, and you know, we know that increases their risk at least 15%, for coronary events, would you, would you put that patient on a statin? Would you recommend annual calcium scores, stress tests, or how would you manage these patients based on what your review of the literature is? Yeah, I think that's a great question, and um, we don't really know what, what, what's the role of primary prevention these patients receiving chemo and or radiation therapy. Um, but obviously those patients that have a higher radiation risk, I think um, at least getting a standard cardiac evaluation, looking at their lipids, looking at their cardiac risk profile, if they're hypertensive, I would treat them aggressively like any other patient. Um, keeping in mind that radiation therapy, as we know from the data, puts patients at higher risk of having coronary calcium core progress progression. So I think it's reasonable to at least get a, uh, in asymptomatic patients, getting a cardiac calcium score just to see what they're at so that, that we can detect these subclinical cardiotoxicity effects earlier on. I have one, one question for you. Given that you know Houston Methodist so well and that you're about to do a two-year imaging fellowship, what is the number one or perhaps number two opportunity for us to be involved in, in multimodality imaging in this field? Yeah. What, do you, what do you want to see us do? Um, I think that's a great question. Actually, um, uh, I'm, I'm working with uh, Dr. Shang and trying to look specifically at one of the, uh, one of the issues is really looking at um, for the patients that come here for CT-guided treatment for radiation therapy planning, 
Um, they have, uh, we have data on long-term, basically follow up on these patients who get zero um, CTs for radiation therapy. Um, I think it'd be interesting to look at um, baseline um, CT. As we know that we were able to calculate calcium scores um, pretty well in non-gated CT scans. And looking at how, uh, what's the rate of progression of having calcium in this population 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the road. So what, I think one of the, a couple of projects that come to mind is really looking at the rate of coronary calcium progression in these patients and looking at the cardiovascular events in these patients. So we have a pretty large breast cancer population that come here for treatment. So I think utilizing the data with the CT data that we have, we are prob probably can find something there. Dr. Reisner. Yeah, Steve, uh, could you comment, that was a very nice talk, but could you comment on the kind of pathology that you get, for instance, in the coronary arteries? Uh, my experience has been that it's not the typical atherosclerotic, it's a much more fibrotic, and we've had trouble dilating and stenting these. So the coronary events are higher, but it's clearly a different kind of mechanism that's that's causing it. Could you comment on that? Yes. Um, so I think, um, so I didn't specifically go into the mechanisms of cardiac toxicity in some of these patients. As, as we know, some of that is kind of uh, unclear. But as we know, radiation therapy causes some sort of oxid oxidative stress and causes micro and macrovascular damage to the vessels. So um, it may not be truly just atherosclerotic pelag. It may be just fibrosis and aluminum stenosis because of the fibrosis. Um, at the same time, a lot of these patients also have concomitant risk factors, hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia. So it's hard to tease out, you know, what's what. If it's, you know, just radiation therapy related versus if it's a combination of radiation therapy and the risk factors. Thank you, Alpha. You're officially off the hot seat. Dr. Solomon, come on up. You're next. You've already been introduced, so it's all yours. Good morning. My name is Ahmed Solomon. I'm one of the senior fellows here at Houston Methodist. And I am going to talk to you today about how we can, we should, and hopefully in the future, near future, will provide more precise care to our cardiology patients and otherwise using technology and artificial intelligence. Um, I do have to tell you, though, that I have no financial disclosures whatsoever. Um, regarding this or otherwise. Um, like most um, healthcare talks, um, you have heard the numbers that we are spending too much um, out of our budgets. You could hear it in virtually every single, uh, virtually every single uh, political campaign, um, see it, uh, uh, news reports. Um, the expenditure is, is getting out of control. Um, and cardiovascular disease is part, and a large part, of the, this expenditure. The other problem that we are facing and we're going to keep on facing is that there's going to be a demand <laughs> supply shortage between the amount of patients and the amount of care that needs to be provided and the amount of providers or physicians that will be able to provide it. Um, and subsequently with that, we're going to have major issues in regards to long waiting times for patients to seek care or to be able to come and see a physician when they need to see a physician or they're referred to see a physician. Um, you can see up here, this is actually very specific to cardiology um, and cardiology outpatient clinics and in major cities like ours, we're averaging about 20 plus days for a cardiovascular patient to be referred to, a, to, to see his doctor. Um, in Texas, when you um, try to see the, uh, uh, the population itself, um, you'll see that, although it's not showing very well up here, that for every one cardiologist, there are 20,000 adult uh, population. So there's one to 20,000 um, in the state of Texas. Um, and doing this presentation, doing the re research on this, there's actually websites out there, apparently. It's very sad to say that there are websites out there to tell or to teach patients how to manipulate the system or try to get in to see a, pa a physician a lot earlier. Um, patients, not seeing, patients not being seen when they need to be seen, um, unfortunately, we'll have a patient come into the ER, and we know what, the eventually, what happens eventually with that, or they go to the, the, the other route, to Dr. Google. 
The, the problem is then you have to deal with the consequences. Um, so what, what's the problem? I mean, we, we are working very hard. Um, we, I don't know how much we're able to get our patients to engage um, as, as we would like them to be. Um, if you take a look and see, there's a lot of surveys out there, but for the most part, all of them agree that the electronic health care system and the extra administrative work burns you out. Understandably so. I think everybody up here would agree to that. Um, the thing is, um, when you're managing health, health, when we see patients for follow for chronic conditions, we see them once every 12 months. We see them once every six months. There are times in between that you don't know what's going on with that patient. You're following them for hypertension, you're following them for dyslipidemia, you're following them for a history of previous PCI or so forth. We're not capturing patients before they present to clinic when there's an uh, issue that we have to manage. So I was trying to, uh, I trying to get an example of this and this actually happened to me this last week. So my father, who gets admitted to the hospital Monday night for shortness of breath um, out of the blue or out of the blue to me. He, my brother takes him two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning to the hospital, to the ER because of shortness of breath. I just saw him this last weekend in my brother's graduation. He's walking around, a little tired, a little fatigued, um, a little short of breath. I thought, you know, he's fasting, he's tired, let it be. And the reason I didn't give it too much thought was about a year ago, he had this atypical chest pain. My dad's the tough guy, old school type of guy that if he says, if he calls me up and says, I've got chest pain, he's got a problem. So we bring him in and he goes and we put him on a treadmill and, and stress him. And he goes nine plus minutes on the treadmill, Bruce protocol, and his new sense perfusion is, is stone cold normal. Okay, 70 plus years old, nine minutes on the treadmill, you're good. And after that, I, know, I see him at home, he walks around, no problem. But I don't really have concrete data on the subtle changes that have been happening over the three, four, last three, four, five months. And that happens to all of us all the time. A patient comes to clinic, they don't tell you, I've got symptoms started yesterday. They usually tell you I've got symptoms started a month ago, two months ago, three months ago. We're not capturing this until they present either to the ER or to clinic. So we're supposed to have um, technology um, that advanced or advancements in technology. And one of the major things was EMRs, right? And it was supposed to provide us a much easier access to data, and it does. It's supposed to make our workflows much easier and better safety profiles for patient management and better communication between physicians and between physicians and patients. Um, but unfortunately, and I think most of us would agree that the electronic healthcare uh, or EMRs, generally speaking, have also made us look into the computer too much and not be able to actually manage the patient themselves. And multiple surveys, there's four or five different surveys out there that will tell you that the EMRs, although is very efficient in some aspects, but it is taking away from us managing our patients. Um, this is the ACC roadmap for innovation. It's a bit complicated, <laughs> but take a look on the top left. For digital health, just about every single aspect up there has to do with smart technology, one way or the other. Um, and I think that cardiology, generally speaking, has uh, or is posed to take the lead on most of the smart technology and the innovative processes to make a major shift in the overall healthcare uh, industry, if you may. Um, FTC is actually on their website. They provide a lot of incentives to make mobile health apps, um, which was not in the past. It usually was in the, in the past. People were not incentivized. Um, a couple of years ago, Congress uh, passed this provision, and this provision has, or this act, has multiple provisions for new software, new innovations, telemedicine or telehealth. So they are recognizing that this can and will be a major factor in, in, in efficient healthcare. 
Um, there are a lot of gadgets out there. And if I started showing you gadgets, we will, we will not finish. But the top left is one of the technologies that I think is going to be a factor also when um, they're, they, they're using mobile technology in which you can press on a device. And with that pressure, according to that pressure, it'll measure the blood pressure given this capillary blood pressure, but it'll give you a blood pressure measurement. All of these are, usual, are still, the second one is a necklace that measures your heart rate, respiratory rate, and so forth. There's a lot of really cool gadgets out there. Uh, Cardio has a very nice blood pressure machine. I tried it out in one of the booths in a, in a meeting a few, a few months ago. Um, very simple, and it measures on your phone, um, and it could uh, um, give that information to your physician. Uh, we know there are wearables, and there are sensory pills where a person would, uh, or a patient would have a patch on his body, and these sensory pills would communicate to that patch, and from that patch to your phone. There's, a, again, a lot of things out there. Skin patches, um, Google on the top left has um, these different um, sensors on, on clothes. Um, there are a lot of different things sensory, sensors-wise that you could use at home. And then there's this ring. This ring is, it came up to me on, 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 on an on a, um, alert on Kickstarter a few, uh, about a year ago uh, from S-Rings. And, and supposedly, they've already tried it and they've had uh, uh, success with it, but this has not been tried out yet, um, to, to, at least to our standards. But it would be able to measure SpO2, it would be able to measure heart rate, heart rate variability, in addition to, as you see, a lot of other aspects of it. Um, so we'll see if this actually comes out to be. Um, Ecos has another device, which I also tried in a, in a booth a few months ago, in which this small device can work as a digital stethoscope, where you could record whatever you listen to and transfer it to a chart, or whatever you want to transfer it to. Um, and it also gives you a one lead EKG at the same time. Very mobile, very easy to use. But the thing is, there's a lot of stuff, and again, we, there's a lot of gadgets out there, we don't want patients to go crazy wearing all, the, all these stuff and you're going to get them confused. But you also don't want the industry to go crazy either and start using stuff like this where you put it on your tooth to count your calories. Um, in, in, in the attempt to provide precision health, um, the customized monitoring part where there's wearables and there's technologies, that is a a very fast growing field and it is very, it's a very productive field. But the, the thing that really requires a lot more work is going to be the, um, the deep neural sensory type of training of data analytics and machine learning. And that's going to require a lot of work. And if you take a look at the market, there are a lot of companies that have a lot of resources back, backing it up in an attempt to provide better mobile health or per, to use artificial intelligence. But the thing with artificial intelligence is it requires data, a lot of data. And the way I think of it is, as, as an example, when you started to learn how to drive at the age of 15, 14, 13 in my case, and at this age, you've accumulated X amount of experience for the last decade, two or three, to learn how to drive and how to manage the street and how to manage everything that comes at you at the street. You're not, you don't need that amount of time to put into data to, 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 to have the software learn. You don't need the time, but you need the amount of data. Just like when Tesla does the autopilots and it's still require, uh, auto drives and it's still autopilot, sorry, and it's still requiring and still doing it until stuff like this happens because it still requires a lot more data and a lot more experience. The other area where artificial intelligence or technology, generally speaking, can be very helpful is going to be research. You can obtain a significant amount of data that would not ever be available to you through traditional trials. Traditional trials where you have a one-time visit, two-time visit, every three months, every six months, every nine months, whatever it may be, with a, with, with a survey and an exam or an image. In these, using technology like this, 
or, or whatever is available as it, as it becomes available, using these technologies, you're going to get a significant amount of data that, is not, uh, that you will never get on these traditional tribes. Um, I don't have much time uh, 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 but to go further in details in regards to these different trials but, and these different studies, but study, the, the other aspect of it is that you're going to be able to get, instead of 5,000 patients for a trial, we're talking about 50,000 patients for trials, 100,000 patients for trials. It's not going to be that hard to get. Um, you could get a lot of different sensory, a lot of different sensory information, and these are uh, seven, if I remember correctly, or six different types of wearables that they're using to get this up, to obtain this information. And you're going to get information that you never thought that you really needed. SpO2 during flights, with with surveys that they're answering during the flight. There's a lot of different data that you could get that you never even thought that you actually needed. Um, and then you have the big companies. So Apple has a open source framework called ResearchKit. Um, this group, for example, had I think about 40 plus thousand patients enrolled and consented in less than three months. They were able to prove the feasibility of mobile consent using these cards, very simple cards. Most of us that have ever, ever worked in research and have an IRB uh, uh, a kit with them that they're going to consent, go consent a patient with, 15, 20 pages of that, uh, uh, three copies or four copies of the, of, of the consent form, you go to a patient and you, frankly, they don't usually read it. You talk to them verbally and you tell them this study is doing this, this, and that. The risks are this and this is how I'm going to protect your identity. You give it to them, here's where you need to sign your five, four, five, six, five signatures and move on. And then they have a copy with them. I assure you, just like anything else, they usually don't read it. This is a simplified way of getting consent. 40,000 patients, 41,000 patients in less than three months. But then the amount of data you get and the amount of interaction and engagement you are able to obtain with patients is, is significant. These are the, in, in regards to this study, and the, thing, the reason I brought this up was looking at the age group. So the age group, you'll see that the engagement of patients are a lot more younger. And the older you get, the less number. But there's been a lot of data out there that elder people or people that are older, elder, I'm going to get in trouble for that. <laughs> older people do have mobile technology, but they have iPhones. They have iPhone 8, 7s, 8s, or what have you, or, or, or Androids, or so forth. They don't have wearables. They don't, they, a lot of our patients that come into clinic, they have iPhones, or they have mobile technology, but they don't wear wearables. And I think this is where that shift is. It's not that they don't know it, they don't really, really use it. Project baseline. I think of it as a mini Framingham study. So they are... Um, starting out with 10,000 patients, lab work, gene, um, imaging, but they're also using a lot of sensory data, a lot of um, watch, sleep, um, activity data on top of that. Um, and they're going to be following them for years. You're going to get Framingham type of information with a lot of other details that are not available in Framingham study. So these are some of the things that they use um, in regards to obtaining that information as they go. And, and surveys and very quick, easy engagement type of surveys almost every day or almost every week on the phone. So we always hear about these wearables in the news about you know, saving lives here or there. So let me give you a couple examples. This is a young girl who is a volleyball player and asymptomatic, but her watch brought up that her heart rate's high on the PPG sensor. And she goes, long story short, she has SVT and she gets an, and, and long story short, she gets an EP ablation. This gentleman eventually finds out that he has a pulmonary embolism. This gentleman somehow eventually finds out that he has a heart attack. Um, this Stanford genesis, geneticist, um, he has seven biosensors on, so you could tell that he's, he's up there. But <laughs> he finds out that he's got Lyme disease and one, the thing that directed him initially to work that up were the sensors that he was wearing. 
Um, I don't know if you've heard of me about the Apple Heart Study. So the Apple Heart Study is a very, very simple study. Every person that buys an Apple Watch um, can sign up for this free of charge and they would follow your heart rhythm. And if your heart rhythm is abnormal, <coughs> your heart rate or heart rate variability is abnormal, it will direct you to a telehealth person off of that study and you speak with them and then they will direct you to go see a physician or so forth. It's free of charge and they tell you on their, on their uh, uh, form that the only thing that you're gonna pay for is probably the 20 megabytes um, of, of uh, use of data uh, on, the, on the watch. They don't, have, they don't show the numbers that they've used yet, but you can imagine how many people are on that study now. This is my personal favorite. I, I got introduced to this with Dr. Valderabano in clinic the Alive Core. So Alive Core uh, or Cardia is a company that spent 45, 50 million dollars over about four, five years in obtaining an artificial intelligent algorithm in uh, being able to identify sinus rhythm from atrial fibrillation. Um, and they've been very successful at doing that. Um, so, and they've got FDA, sorry, they've got FDA approval for specifically this. But then they said, what else can we do? So a couple of years ago, this group from Mayo Clinic did what they called a bloodless blood test, where they used an algorithm to evaluate, um, I think it was about 600 plus thousand EKGs. Um, and to do an algorithm to calculate high, high potassium. And then they studied it on 10 patients an hour before and during and after hemodialysis. They had a very good correlation, but they had a lot of noise. They partnered with a life core to do for a life core to, 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 to participate in this. What a life core did, um, and according to their CEO, what they provide they put in an, what is called an unsupervised deep neural network where they basically put the artificial think of it as you're putting in the artificial intelligence or putting in the software to review 600,000 EKGs and telling it you figure out what the differences are and that line with the lab work was a was a virtual match out of that um, I think they had about 90 plus percent specificity and about 75, 78 percent sensitivity to hyperkalemia. But these are just the simple ideas that are coming up as they go. Um, this is also a part of LifeCore, but this is a, 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 the, what's called a cardio band. You add it on to your, to your Apple Watch. And what it does is um, you're not going to check your, um, your heart rhythm all the time right? For, let me go back a step. For you to, for in, the, in, the, in the view of artificial intelligence and personalized medicine, the whole point of it is you want to be identified as you, not as somebody else. So what they did also previously was they, AliveCore did a project or did, a, did some work in obtaining the identity of EKGs, meaning if I did five EKGs, five different days, you would not be able to tell that that's my EKG, number two, number three, number four, number five. They are able to do that. And the whole point of this is that they are able to identify this is your normal, this is your norm. So if you, and, 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 as, and as it gets to know you better, if you every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, in the morning go to the gym, your activity level goes up, your heart rate goes up, and they measure that calculation, they know that that's you. Now, if you have an abnormal rhythm for whatever reason, it'll ask you, is this you? Because you know, we could always, hey, somebody else check your, check, you know, check your rhythm and let somebody else use it. So it wants to make sure that this is you. And you identify that this is you, it'll tell you there's, a something, there's an abnormality that's occurring and you need to seek uh, uh, care. So the, that PPG sensor is just measuring, it's a software sensor, it's just measuring rate to rate variability, heart rate rhythms, and what your norm is. 
it sees something out of the norm, it'll ask you, please pour your finger, let's get, a, let's get an EKG. And it's very user friendly. It has tons of things that you could use. This is actually what I saw with Dr. Valderabano. It's on top, on, on, on the part of the phone, on the back of the phone, where basically you're holding your phone, you just put your fingers at the back of the phone, and it, me and it gives you an EKG. Um, and they uh, um, partnered with Omron, which is blood pressure. And all this information, if there is a problem, it goes to CardioPro, which is the physician side of it. Now, to the elephant in the room, if you may, is always the concern is that, are, is artificial intelligence supposed to take our jobs? Is it going to replace us? Um, so Stan, uh, Stanford uh, has this software called ChessXNet where um, they put in about 100,000 images from 30,000 patients into this software to learn <laughs> how to measure or how to diagnose pneumonia. And they used heat sensors. Then they sat down with four radiologists, four radiologists, and they basically compared their readings to the readings of the software. And for the most part, they were either as good as or better than the radiologist readings of the software of, of the x-rays. So you look at this and you say, okay, so are they going to try to attempt to use artificial intelligence to do a lot of our jobs? Here's the thing. Um, there's, there's the process itself where this is a radiology process because this is what one of their responses, but this is a radiology process where a patient comes in, you need to figure out what kind of test that needs to be done. That's usually not through artificial intelligence. Scheduling, that could be done technology, that's not a problem, that's already there. Um, Post-processing, I think Dr. Mamarian would tell you that doesn't work that well. Um, but the idea, and, and all the way down until at the end when you write a report, but the idea is that artificial intelligence or technology is there to augment you. It is not there to replace you. So, and, and, and what a lot of the response of the radiologist was, you know what, I don't want to start counting the, or measuring the seven lymph nodes that are on a CT scan. If I pass by and those are counted well, move on to the next step. At the end of the day, some of these are automated, but none of them, not all of it. And then at the end, you will never have a company or a software that would take the responsibility, or for, or for that matter, a malpractice company that would cover the reads of a company. It would be still your read, it would be augmented through technology or artificial software. And, and end of end automation is not going to happen. Um, they attempted that in different uh, uh, um, uh, processes that, that, that uh, I'm sorry, different industries that dealt with human beings directly. Um, and they attempted that with um, the, um, with pilots doing uh, pilotless uh, flights and that backfired. But not all is rosary, right? So you've got problems with wearable technology. Um, it provides you a copious amount of, in, uh, of data. Um, and not all of it is clinically relevant. So if somebody sends you that amount of data, what are you supposed to do with it? How are you going to interpret it? And that actually, if you think about it, will actually use up more of your time, not less. And that is where medical grade type of data would need to be verified. And it will take some time for this data to be tweaked, if you may. The second concern of, of, of a lot of people is security. The security of mobile technology was always, mobile technology when it started, it started out for fitness. It didn't necessarily start out for health. It started out for fitness. And when it started going into the health industry or it started going into the um, health arena, they don't have to abide by the same rules that EMRs do. EMRs have to abide by HIPAA, violate, HIPAA uh, rules. Mobile technology does not. But I think that that's not going to be a major factor because if they are able to communicate with our EMR system, that's obviously going to be a major point before they're ever able to do so. So are you going to be able to bill for all this stuff? You're going to use some time in reviewing this or your office staff. Fortunately, over the last year, more CPT codes and more recognition from CMS, from the FDA, is showing that 
I think there's going to be, start becoming a shift in regards to the ability to bill for mobile and remote technology. Um, and, and different incentives are going to start becoming more available. Um, there's a tremendous opportunity to incorporate um, personal technology or personal um, health technology um, into the system. But it has to be clinically relevant. relevant. Um, but using this, I think you're going to have a much higher chance of having patient engagement. At the um, MDCA, years ago, we were using paper charts. Subsequently, we used NextGen. After that, we went to Athena. All that while we were using Method in the hospital. And then comes in Epic. Um, so I've, I've had the privilege of being Dr. Kleiman's fellow for the last three years. Um, Dr. Kleiman has a very good memory. So when we go see a patient, he'll tell you, you know, this patient we did this autumn two years ago, he was in the hospital for a good period of time, and, but he eventually came out of it, he had to have a pericardial window. He'll tell you. He has a very good memory of it. But you go to the chart, and that chart says, you know, PCI to the RCA, on DAPT, doing well, continue. <laughs> so what we did was we went back into the system and as for every week that there's a patient that comes in or every week of clinic, I would go into the system the week before, go into method, go into the paper chart, go into Athena, and basically make a story for that patient. It's basically an HPI, two, three paragraphs, whatever it may be, simple, complicated, however it may be. And then when the patient would come in, we would go to the patient and say, Mr. Smith John, here's what I know about you. He'll tell you, yes, that's correct, or he'll tell you, no, uh, by the way, I did this, or, or if there's more information that you want to find out. And then you put it into Epic, and then that becomes your baseline, and it's there. Hopefully it won't change it, uh, after Epic again, theoretically. But then the information is there, right? It makes things a little bit more simpler. You can add your diagnosis as much as you want to. You've got more, uh, more than other, other diseases that needs to be managed. Um, the other point was we had a scribe. So we had a scribe that, sorry, we had a scribe that basically would work on, um, would, would, would dictate for, uh, um, in, in clinic. The scribe would write down uh, different things, for example, like, like Dr. Kleiman would be discussing with the patient, and the scribe would write down, I will uh, place a catheter in both of your groins and go up to the aorta, <laughs> and um, uh, against the native valve, I'm going to put a stent. And that's what's going to be in the note. Then that means that we have to go back into the note and readjust it again. Within a year, that scribe was able to understand everything, and by the end of that year, he was writing things correctly. But then the scribe, good for him, went to med school. That comes into somebody else, and we have to do that all over again. That's the whole point of artificial intelligence. Um, let me go a little faster. Google and Stanford have this digital scribe, where basically they went to a family practice and basically put a wearable um, a mic a microphone on them, and they would dictate into the microphone and uh, provide, and artificial intelligence would make a note out of that discussion. But let me tell you something real quick that I'm really excited about. So I got the chance to meet with Dr. Rob Harrington this last ACC in March. We had a quick discussion about digital assistants, which I think is going to be something that's very exciting. And we're gonna call him Alexa for, just for the sake of uh, um, this, this talk. So Alexa knows already about your patient. They already know about the previous history, all that front end work that you've already done. You go into the room, and you have that discussion with the patient, Alexa is listening to you, and using that artificial intelligence that learns from you, it will build that note. And it will build a full note. You examine the patient using digital uh, stethoscope, that holosystolic murmur is going to be transferred to the chart. You want to take a picture of that JVD that gets transferred to the chart automatically. Or if the patient's exam is stone cold normal, Alexa stone cold normal, just like we do on a smart phrase, uh, on Epic. And then, after the exam, you say, Alexa, we're going to order a CT taver, 
uh, to be done in two weeks. We need, a C, we need an echocardiogram uh, for aortic stenosis in six months to follow up, and I need to see him in uh, three months. You walk out the door, the note is done, the orders are done, and that patient's already either made the appointment or knows how to make the appointment on mobile technology. And you're done. You just have to sign that uh, 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 note at the end of the day, which will take you about 30 seconds if there's any corrections that you need to add on. Um, and it will also send the uh, post-visit patient follow-up, which we're supposed to do, and we do. Um, so quickly, I know I don't have many more, much more time, but um, let me tell you something real quick. The idea of machines, again, or artificial intelligence and the concern for artificial intelligence taking over, um, I, I think is not real and at least not in our industry. Um, but there's a lot of concerns. So my wife, who's a clinical pharmacist and much smarter and technologically advanced than I am, would, um, when we have these discussions, because she did some of her work in residency about patient efficiency, um, she would tell you that, and, and, she, and I think she echoes the concern of a lot of other people. The more you use automation, the more you use technology in healthcare, the more you're going to disengage from a patient the more you're going to lose that humanism or that uh, a touch with the patient, which is a part of your management. Part number two is you're going to lose a lot of jobs. And, and I've been married much longer than I've been a fellow, so I'm a much better trained husband than I am a fellow. <laughs> so the answer is automatically, yes, you're right. But you think of it. We, over the last couple of centuries, have advanced tools to help us. Some of these tools were not used correctly, some of them have. At the end of the day, it's a matter of how you use the tool. Um, Dr. Her Dr. Harrington had this uh, uh, slide, 1981, Dr. Califf uh, from Duke. He says, proper interpretation and use of computerized data will depend as much on wise doctors as any other source of data in the past. And this is in 1981 from a journal called the Western Journal of Medicine. Had to find that. Um, so um, to, to I, I believe that we have to be more, we have to be more invested in, 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 the, in artificial intelligence as this grows. We know as clinicians that this could drive healthcare and drive more efficient care for our patients. Um, there's gonna be concerns that are gonna show up and that it's gonna develop. We could manage that as we go. <laughs> We, uh, you know, things have changed over the last uh, uh, couple of decades. I think that technology and artificial intelligence in healthcare is going to be the major paradigm shift that's going to change how we manage our patients. Um, last but not least, I would like to thank, appreciate, and pay our respects to some of the best cardiologists there is that helped us where we're at today. Thank you. I know. <laughs> Thank you, Ahmed. You covered a lot of ground uh, and did a great job. Um, yeah. Conscious of time, we're going to go with one question, I think. Dr. Q, you get the honors. First, I, first I want to congratulate uh, Alpana and you, Ahmed. Both have given lectures at a caliber of anybody that we would invite here. So congratulations to the two of you. Second, the topic you chose was incredibly timely. In fact, this morning, driving over NPR, was interviewing the CEO of Mayo Clinic exactly on this topic. And they were talking about challenges and the things that are going on. And a big issue that came up, of course, is the issue of privacy. How are we going to be able to deal with the privacy concerns when we interact with all these devices? Which is one thing that you may not have time to discuss, but clearly it's going to be one of the challenges that will have to be addressed. Last but not least, if since you're joining us on faculty, if you want to take this as an interest topic to research and you need some old folks, Dr. Reisner and I will volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be happy to do so, sir. Okay, so that was our first Fellows Grand Rounds. Uh, we have an encore performance uh, next Thursday, so come and join us, and our other two senior fellows will, will uh, regale us as well. 
Uh, for fellows and, and uh, teaching faculty, we have a little photo op at the moment uh, over in the RI, so please join us. Thanks, everybody.